So our topic this morning is about journeys and faith, and I will introduce John Guilfoyle, who's our guest speaker this morning. John will be speaking to us in a little bit um, about his journey to the Baha'i faith. I really want to thank John for prompting this conversation or this thought about um, our faith journeys. Um, you know, as Unitarian Universalists, we all have a very similar story about how we got to UUism. You know, it kind of goes like this. Yeah, I was brought up in the X religion, and that was great, and then at X point in my life, you know, I realized there was some discord or something happened, and so I left my, my religion, and then for a while I was away from that, any religion, and then I stumbled upon Unitarian Universalism, and I've been here ever since. <laughs> That's kind of how our story goes. Um, but that kind of only describes, like, the big waypoints on your journey. So, um, you know, when we do a trip, we'll often say to people, you know, I drove to across Canada last summer and I went to, like, uh, Calgary and then Regina and then Thunder Bay and then Toronto. Those are, like, the big waypoints. Um, yeah, Winnipeg. I knew you'd say that, Barry. <laughs> but, you know, in the quieter moments, you often, often we realize that there are many other places or moments in between where, like, the big aha moments happen, right? Or where the deepest reflections or insights or the hardest moments happen. And that's true about our faith journeys, too. Um, there are often these moments that deeply shape us and who we are, but they don't always come to mind kind of immediately. So when John raised this topic, um, and I had time to think, and I actually had a lot of fun just kind of wandering through my memory and wondering about, you know, what has shaped me and where I am now on my faith journey. I'd love to have much more of a conversation about this, but um, I have just a couple points that I'll choose to share right now. I'm going to take you to Unionville, Ontario. So um, that's really quite close to Toronto. Um, it's where I grew up. I moved there when I was three, and I left when I was going away to university, kind of age 19. Um, and Unionville, at that point, was a little agricultural community. Uh, we had farms everywhere. Slowly, in the 19 years I was there, the farm fields were replaced by subdivisions, and now it's all part of the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area. But when I was growing there, there was, you know, farm fields nearby and deer in our backyard. Um, in fact, I recently learned that Inga Pullman lived in Unionville um, for a few years that I was there also, so that's kind of a fun connection. Um, the waypoint there is for Central United Church. And that was uh, what the church that I went to. Uh, we started going when I was three, so I went for as long as I ever remember. Um, and this church is called Central United Church. It was one of five or six churches in Unionville. Um, it was one of the larger ones. It went through this huge expansion while we were there. And that church was definitely formative for me in my kind of faith journey. Now, in the past, when I've reflected on like, how I got to where I am now in my faith, I would have always mentioned youth group at Central United, because that was formative for me. That got me through high school, um, being part of the youth group. Uh, so that would have been like a big waypoint on my journey. But as I reflected, I thought more about some of the other things at Central United that really kind of were pivotal for me. So here's a fun photo for you. Recognize anyone out there? <laughs> Okay, so that's me. It was 1983. It's very convenient how we had the, the dates put on photos back then. We don't do that anymore, but anyway. Um, so I was 12 years old, and this was uh, CGIT. Anyone else do CGIT? Any of the women? Yeah, okay. So CGIT was this um, group. Uh, it started actually in 1915, at the time of World War I, and the powers that be, the spiritual leaders, faith organizations, realized they wanted to give women, men were away at war, they wanted to give women um, both vocational but spiritual skills um, to cope in World War I. And it they carried on. It still actually exists today, but very few places, very few members. Um, but at one point, it had like 40,000 girls across the country. It's kind of akin to Girl Guides, but true to Canadian style, we had to develop our own, right? Anyway. Um, so uh, our church started a CGIT group in the 1980s. I think that would have been the first year. And um, what was really interesting about that was uh, it was open. When they started it at our church, they opened it to girls in the community. It was aimed at girls age 12 to 17. And so any girls age 12 to 17 could join. So in our group that actually met at our church, we had girls from other churches. Like, so this was really different for me. Like, what my concept of church was, I would go to church on Sunday, I knew the people who I would see at church, but, like, that was it. And then you kind of lead the rest of your life. And at age 12, 13, I had this experience of, like, kind of a bit interfaith. 
Okay, well, not so interfaith. We were all white Christian girls. But anyway, um, but they were from other churches, right? Like those were the girls from the Alliance Church. I'd never been in the Alliance Church. I didn't even really know who belonged to the Alliance Church because you don't, didn't talk about that stuff at school, right? So that was kind of formative that we could share um, some values and some activities. I knew these girls from the school or from baseball, but I didn't know them in a religious context. Um, and so it was probably something at that point of my life that kind of nudged me in the direction of the UU principle, acceptance of one another and encouragement of spiritual growth in a really small way as a teenager. The second small point that I'm aware of happened around my confirmation. I guess I was confirmed in the United Church. I was confirmed when I was 15, and I'm sure you know the process of confirmation in churches. You go through a series of classes. Usually you have an interview with the minister, and then you do this formal kind of confirmation ceremony. Uh, the minister we had, we had two ministers in our church at the time, and one was Reverend Deb. So that itself was formative, that I knew a female religious leader at age 10, 11, 12, 13. There were none others in Unionville, so that was formative. Um, but when I had my interview with her, I remember being quite anxious. So this would have been in 1986, and abortion was topical at the time, right? Um, if you remember, like the Morgan Teller case went to the Supreme Court of Canada in 1988. So this was before that. And I remember going to my confirmation interview to chat with Deb because in the United Church at that time, we had voices, you know, out on the streets, women were protesting women's rights, women's bodies. And in, in contrast to that, you had voices from the United Church saying things like women's bodies, women's rights. Um, they would say, well, yeah, women's bodies, they don't belong to them. Women's bodies belong to God. <laughs> which I just, I find astounding that that was said publicly, but it was. So the United Church was not pro-abortion. It, it later became actually one of the earlier churches, churches to support women's rights, um, but it wasn't at the time. So I walked into my confirmation interview, fired up. I was 15, I'm fired up about, you know, social justice people. We all are in our young, younger years. Some of us carry that on actively, but, um, and I remember being really anxious because I, I had to have this conversation and feeling very uncomfortable because uh, I knew for me what was clearly right and the United Church's stance was not right in my mind. The world's stances wasn't right. Um, so I remember feeling anxious that maybe I shouldn't even be confirmed. And what I remember is walking into that interview with Reverend Deb, and I don't remember the words, but I remember the feeling. And the feeling was, it was like she took an arm, put it around me, and said, it's okay. The world hasn't figured this out yet, and our church certainly hasn't figured this out yet. And so for me as a young woman, um, being fired up, to have a religious organization accept that maybe we haven't figured it out, or even a leader in our own religious institution say, it's okay, we hadn't figured it out yet. That was kind of pivotal for me. And it undoubtedly probably inched me closer towards that free and responsible search for truth and meaning. I would love to share um, more stories as I reflected, but maybe we can do that at coffee time. Certainly to reflect on the big and the little waypoints. I do want to say one other thing about Central United Church. Uh, in the last year that I was there, there was a big conflict in the church had something to do with a couple congregants and a faction and a minister, and that's a bit of a familiar story, isn't it? And what I want to say is, this church is still there. They just celebrated their 175th anniversary. Because you know what? These things happen in faith organizations. Um, Nadia Boltzweber, she's this awesome radical faith leader in the Lutheran Church, and she says, if you belong to a religious organization, you will at some point be disappointed. That's part of what happens in faith organizations and people come through, and it becomes actually a waypoint on our individual and our collective faith journey. So some people right now, they're doubling down, they're gonna stick on the journey they're on. Other people, they're gonna take a right turn. Other people, they're gonna go on a little detour, and they're not yet decided whether they're gonna come back or they're gonna carry on on another path. That's okay, that's people's faith journeys. Yeah, so may it be so here. It gives me great delight to introduce John. John is a colleague and a friend, and I'm gonna take a few minutes to tell you about John's background, because I know he's a very humble man, and he might not tell you about himself uh, in the same way. And I think when you hear about the diversity of roles and work and the countries John's lived in and the activities he's done, I think you'll have a better context to hear the message that he's gonna share with us today. John is a physician who's had an incredibly diverse and varied career in medicine. You'll hear as soon as he begins to speak that he originated in Ireland. We joked with Bev that she had to get the Irish like voice part of this translation for when he speaks. Okay, you'll get it when he speaks anyway. Um, when he first came to Canada, uh, they started in rural Newfoundland, and then he moved west to Manitoba, 
He worked as a rural physician there, and he was also the chief medical officer of health of Manitoba. So like Bonnie Henry, but for Manitoba. He had a short time in the Caribbean as the chief medical officer for a small Caribbean country there, and he was responsible for the National Health Service Program. When he came back to Canada, he was director of the residency program for family medicine at the University of Manitoba. John's time in Manitoba helped develop his interest in Aboriginal health, and he moved to um, Sioux Lookout, where he worked with an Aboriginal organization there. At the same time, he retrained, 20 years into his career, he retrained to do obstetrical surgery, uh, supported by a fellowship from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. He's done work internationally with the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists to further um, services in pregnancy and childhood. Whew. That's a lot. John's currently semi-retired. He's trying hard to retire. He lives in Squamish, and he still does some locum work, primarily in smaller, harder to access locations. He currently serves as the director of Pebbles to Pearls Foundation, which supports access to education, particularly for girls and women, as a route to well-being and prosperity. And, as Alison referenced, he's the incoming president for the Canadian branch of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which is committed to the abolition of nuclear weapons, the prevention of war, the promotion of non-violent means of conflict resolution, and social justice in a sustainable world. Outside of work, John is an avid sailor, hiker, biker, and muse uh, musician. He's happily married to Geraldine for 40 years. Um, and he always refers to Geraldine, now remember he's a sailor, he always, when we speak, refers to Geraldine as the Admiral. I love it. Husbands take note, it's a really wise move there, just gonna say. They have two adult children, Jonathan and Regan, who both work in healthcare, and two grandchildren. So, thank you, John, for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing your wisdom and your experience. And down. Can, oh, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear myself. That's great. Well, it is such an extraordinary pleasure to be here. This was such a wonderful introduction to what, what I'm hopefully able to share and so I'll have to stop spitting my S's and Just move it further away from, your face. from my face. Exactly. Well, yeah, that might require surgery. Um, how's that? Brilliant. Good. Excellent. So no, and um, I just love everything about what you've had to experience today, and particularly the um, singing, because. It reminded me of a Baha'i writing, which is, um, music is a ladder by which the soul may ascend. And I just think that's, you know, so beautiful. And we'd had that experience together. So thank you for that. Anyway, a journey towards fate. Um, as mentioned before, I'm a physician and um, not able to get this clicker to work. There we go. So a prairie setting. I was in the early 1980s working in a small rural town in Manitoba. Full service family practice, two young kids, and um, uh, really very busy. But one day I had been speaking to a farmer just before lunch and told him, you know, the biggest threats to your health now are um, you're smoking. And maybe you drink a little bit too much and maybe you could lose a little bit of weight. And then I went out for a run around a prairie section. Now, that time I was a lot fitter than I am now, but I would run for half an hour and get four miles done. And that was in a time of great geopolitical instability. Those of you who have the gray hair will remember, but those of you who don't won't. But I'm running around the prairie, or this section, and I look up overhead, and in that bright blue sky of, that only Manitoba has, there were two B-52 bombers, each one of them containing all of the explosives that were dropped in the, all the theaters in the Second World War. And their mission each day back then was to go to the Arctic Circle, and unless they got an order to countermand they were to launch missiles that would have destroyed the USSR as we know it. So I'm running along and I look up and I think 
maybe I've got it a little bit wrong about the biggest threat to that farmer's health <laughs> is his individual behavior, that there's maybe a more collective response that we all share and should be concerned about. So I was very involved, and at that point, the, um, there was an international movement for physicians to work towards prevention of nuclear war. And it actually was extraordinarily successful. It won the Nobel Peace Prize in 85. This is, this is 86, and was actually quite useful in helping the USSR in particular, because there was a relationship between a Boston cardiologist and the health, Minister of Health in the Soviet Union that was so strong that at this point, every Soviet physician was a member of the Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War. So there was really a, an international kind of physician recognition that this was a huge problem. So I was part of the Canadian Peace Alliance, which we were working as an agenda, bringing all kinds of groups together. We had everybody from the Duke of Ors to the Canadian Labour Congress under the one roof, looking at an agenda for peace. And I was at a meeting. And it was wonderful, wonderful people, but I can remember coming out of the meeting and being strongly struck because there were so many different agendas. Do you know what I mean? It, there was a different little piece. Everybody had their particular thing. And I remember thinking to myself, my gosh, we need something that's just so more overarching and able to bring us together if we're going to move to a world which is going to get rid of the threat both of nuclear weapons and prevent war and all of that. So, on the plane home, and this w I was at a meeting in Calgary, I was given this little booklet by a physician who I'd actually I'd met him for the first time, but he, he happened to be a Baha'i, living in Brandon, which was about 80 kilometers from Hamiota, where I, where I lived. Anyway, he said, we normally wouldn't do this because, um, and I, I explained why, he says, but you might be interested, because we talked about peace and all of this stuff, because I was, you know, obviously concerned about it, and so was he. Anyway, um, so he gave me this and I read it, and that was really which I was struck, and I would argue that no matter who you are, this is worthy of reading, and it really was such a cogent, overview and treatise on the challenges we face as humanity. And that was, was at the forefront of, of, of my concerns at the time. And so it was written by the Universal House of Justice, which is the governing body of the Baha'is of the world. So it brought me straight into who the heck wrote this and who the heck are they? Okay, because I grew up in Ireland. I had a, I'm, I, from a Catholic um, background. I was educated by priests, wonderful priests, and I had no great, I had no great real attraction to religion, except that it was part of my life, and I had no great antipathy to religion. You know what I mean? I was kind of, we were living in a community which had a united church, and we went there to worship with the people, and there was this wonderful um, minister who was actually from Belfast, but he was so welcoming and, you know, this was a, in, you know, a contrast to some extent to the kind of world I'd left in, 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 in Ireland. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, so who are the Baha'is? Well, it's a religion, <laughs> it's worldwide, and it has, the central tenets are unity of God, there's one God, all the religions really are one. They're pathways to the same place and the same purpose. And the unity of humanity. We get into our trousers one leg at a time, no matter where we are in the world. It had twin messengers, okay? Every great religion has had a teacher, an educator, to help us understand. The first was called the Bob, and that means the gate and to some extent a little parallel to Christianity, like John the Baptist, a herald. And he was the herald for the promised one of all ages, who would, and he fulfilled the prophecies of Shia Islam. He was particularly related to Shia Islam, but his major role was to herald the coming of the promise of all ages, who 
the Baha'i see is Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah means the glory of God. Born 1815, died in 1892, and he claims to fulfill the prophecies of all the major religions. That this is a culmination of um, what has been forecast for humanity. And he marks the separation between what he described as the circle of prophecy of God's plan to now the circle of fulfillment. That we are now in a stage where we can go on to actually implement what is, has been hoped and dreamed for through all the faiths of the world to this point. The most unique individual or the, the, the unique piece of the Baha'i faith is Abdul Baha. He was son of Baha'u'llah and he became the interpreter of Baha'u'llah's words and really became the exemplar because when you have a great messenger, you know, what does it mean in your day-to-day -day living? We have this figure who lived, he was born literally on the night of the announcement of the Bab. And he lived until 1921, so he obviously lived longer than his father, and he was very much, um, for the Baha'is, the inter he, he interpreted and helped the Baha'is understand the practicalities of what his father's teachings were. You probably can't see this, I'm sorry about that, but the principal teachings are one progressive revelation. And what is understood by that, or at least my limited understanding, is that God's plan to humanity has been serially unfolded as the capacity of humanity both to understand and implement changes. That God's plan is not like a computer program, you get just the first version and that's it. It is serially unfolded and so all the religions each one serves a particular and distinct purpose, but collectively they're all designed to work together. Independent search for truth. At this point in human history, each individual is responsible for their own spiritual journey. So there is no clergy in the Baha'i faith. Allied to this is the importance of universal education. One can't independently search without education being there at the same time. You, um, elimination of prejudice. If we are one human family, then to be prejudicial against anybody for any reason is not acceptable, is not useful. Equality of men and women. Humanity is a bird. It has two wings. Until both are equally developed, humanity cannot achieve what it is intended to achieve. Harmony between science and religion. Religion, with, which does not acknowledge the wonderful things that science has produced, can create superstitions. Science, without a moral compass, can create monsters. And so the harmony between these two things is important. So those are some of the principal and major teachings. The, the last one, and there are more, but is the next stage of development in humanity is a recognition of the oneness and that globalization in human affairs is a process that will now begin to start and flourish as humanity moves on. So those are the principal teachings. So that's what I found. So given, you know, um, where I was and my, on my, my concerns about this broader picture, this very much answered one, a vision of the world which um, was important and uh, a way of analyzing it and, and using these teachings as, as a way of, of, of being hopefully useful. Um, so these are just some of the, the, the little take-homes. Now, how are we doing for time? I just, we're good? All right. The okay. Let your vision be world-embracing, which is that notion that every problem, we need to begin to see it in its widest context, and then we can narrow down 
as we go from the globe to the nation to the region to the locality to your family there's a logical interaction between all of these things but if it doesn't start with a, a world embracing vision we may miss important linkages well this is the challenge for um when you know i'm introduced as a bahai i'm not a bahai i'm becoming <laughs> a bahai <laughs> because the target that any faith sets is to many um to a large extent almost unachievable you know we are in a process and a journey towards something and the biggest arbiter of our success in that is not what we say it's what we do let deeds not words be your adorning so this was echoed in this is echoed in the bahai writings and one of the other ones i just wanted to share because there's bahaula wrote almost 100 volumes okay he was imprisoned from 1853 until he died in 1892 so he had this life which allowed him to produce this corpus of work which is for humanity's benefit but it's um it's it's it, it's it's a wonderful source of um at least from in my opinion but this i think is an important statement let not a man glory in that he loves his country rather let him rather glory in this that he loves his kind and we have a world where we've certainly seen in the last couple of hundred years both the growth of and some of the destructive forces of nationalism and i'm as proud of being irish as the next person let me tell you okay i play the irish flute and i think nationality and identity are all important but the loyalty we have to our nation must now be superseded by our loyalty to the to the globe that it supports us all and our common humanity does not recognize borders or ethnic divisions or religious divides or whatever divides we've chosen to justify everything from hatred to, to genocide have got to we've got to remove those and put them into the the stream of history and keep the good bits like irish music and get rid of some of the you know get rid of some of the bits which you know the kind of hatreds that that have characterized some of the the dialogues and 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 discourse okay next thing and i think this is this is this is critically important be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age in which you live and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements we're the only people who can fix the problems that we now face and we can help fix them for those who come after us but only if we're involved in the challenges we face and the challenges we face now are different to those we faced in our youth some of them are the same but some of them are different and will go on and so this is an important um because from the bahai perspective there are twin purposes in life one is to come to know god that's an individual search your your business really and the other is to help an ever advancing civilization and that's what we're all involved with i'd mentioned that and just wanted to this this is so important because to some extent we don't and sometimes we feel well in canada equality of men and women we've somehow we've, we 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 are you know we are a world standard world bearer in, in this we have so much room in which we need to recognize that that is not the case and that until not just women's voices because that's one aspect but the qualities the characteristics that women exemplify have to come into every sphere of human activity and they're not there you know we have a world which is 
I mean, totally based on competition. I mean, can you imagine just a human family behaving, this, behaving the way we do in the global sphere, where we don't care for half, you know, 60% of the world don't have adequate access to food? You know what I mean? That where 80% of the world's resources are being consumed by 20% of the population. Do you know what I mean? That means in a family that most of the people in the family are not getting anything and there's one or two in the family who are getting it all. These, these are things, and so it's not a pious, and I was going to start with an acknowledgement at the start and I kind of, yeah. My mother, you know, I mean, my mother was such an important person. So she was just, one, she was a remarkable individual, but her whole role in helping educate me, because mothers are the primary educators in the world. I mean, dads are important, but mothers, you know, all of us remember what our mothers <laughs> told us if we were fortunate enough to have that experience with our moms. They were very important. So anyway, that's um, the next one is, I think, important. When a thought of war comes, oppose it. Oppose it with a stronger thought of peace. This is not just between nations. This is our individual daily living. And it's such uh, it's so important in the world we currently live in because we're still going back to what I would suggest are age-old ways of behaving toward each other. And in fact, you know, the world we're in at the moment is, in my opinion, more unstable than it was in the 1980s when, you know what I mean, I started on this journey, unfortunately. And I don't mean that to, to be a downer, but this is an important concept that we can consciously be peaceful. It is a learned process. We can work on that. When we feel that anger rise, we just, we just push back on it. This is probably um, a the key message of Baha'u'llah. The well-being of mankind, its peace and security, is really not achievable until we recognize our unity, until we begin to understand the oneness, the oneness of um, our human family, the oneness of God if we are people of faith, and even the oneness of just believing to get together. Do you know what I mean? That we can make a better world, regardless of your version of God, because that's a whole other subject, but I, I will not get into that. Um, so, so this, this, I think, is just useful, because you're a community of faith, and I think that there's a case to be made for religion. I'm a person of faith and I think it's important because I think the corpus of religious teachings from all the great religions are there as, as the birthright of humanity and can be used. The Baha'i faith just happens to be the most recent one. But religion should unite all hearts and cause wars and disputes to vanish from the face of the earth give birth to spirituality, and bring life and light to each heart. This is what Abdu'l-Baha says is the purpose of religion. If religion becomes the cause of dislike, hatred, and division, it were better to be without it. That, and, and I'm going to stop there. That, I think, is a question for everybody of faith. If Religion is not uniting, whether it's at a local level, at a community level, at a national level, or at a global level. We're better off without it. And I think people of faith, we're, that's, a ch that's the challenge for people of faith in the world at the moment is. How can we show that religion is unifying and useful? Because any religion which is not a cause of love and unity is no religion. And this is just a practical thing. There's a wonderful little book of, um, called The Hidden Words. And I mean, it's really interesting because I all, often think that sometimes when a title is given, it's actually the opposite to what it should be. Like the Sunshine Coast, right? 
Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. So these are the hidden words and they shouldn't be hidden. <laughs> okay. These are little aphorisms which grasp the, the, the central kernels of, 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 of spiritual um, teachings. But the first one, the first one is, my first counsel is this, possess a pure, kindly, and radiant heart that thine may be a sovereignty, imperishable and everlasting. Okay? And, you know, I mean, and then all the rest is common. You know, as you know, that the, re <laughs> the one of the things that sometimes happens is that we mix up first order principles with second and third and fourth. Do you know what I mean? We somehow, you know, forget in the heat of whatever that really the first thing we should be doing is possessing a pure, kindly, and radiant heart. Because then, I mean, how do we then face or deal with an issue? It, 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 it's, it's a, it, it will assist us, okay? Um, and this is, this is really my last point. Um, or not, there are lots of other points, but and the honor and this distinction of the individual consists in this, that he among all the world's multitudes should become a source of social good. And this goes back to the notion that we're all, each one of us, responsible for helping humanity and, and the world advance. That become, is any larger bounty conceivable then an individual looking within himself should find by the confirming grace of God he has become the cause of peace and well-being of happiness and advantage to his fellow men so that's the question no by the one true God there is no greater bliss no more complete delight so in finishing, because I think we're, I've, you've, I've ta I've, thank you so much for the, the audience. Um, that's what I found. And it's a continuing journey and something which um, I've been enormously grateful for. But, but enormously grateful for what brought me to it. Because this journey was not just started on a mountain in Canmore or on a plane from Brandon when I got that message. It started when my mom was teaching me, when I was growing up in Ireland, when I was learning from all the people that I've had the privilege to interact with over the years. So, um, so that's, that's my story and thank you very much for listening. John has a wise and gentle and kind, playful spirit that I've always admired. And recently, John, I stumbled upon a poem. Um, it's a favorite poem of mine by Rupi Kaur, and I thought of you. Um, and in this, this poem, you could substitute the word beauty or love or peace. And it goes like this. For you to see beauty here does not mean that there is beauty in me. It means that there is beauty rooted so deep within you that you can't help but see it everywhere. As we draw our service to a close, I'd like to invite you to stay in the sanctuary for a few minutes with John afterwards for a Q&A. There is coffee and soup downstairs, whether you choose to go immediately or whether you go afterwards. The line might be shorter after the Q&A. And I know there's lots of soup downstairs. And um, we would extinguish the flame. Oh, it is. It looked like it wasn't lit a second ago. So there you go. I'm glad. It is still going. It is. There you go. So we extinguish this flame, but carry with us the light of vision and the warmth of hope. The world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. And we go forth with courage and love. And John, do you have some closing words for us? Now I do, did, ah, here we are, ah. Um, Yes, uh, this, this is just a couple of lines from when Abdul Baha visited North America. He did it in 1912, and it was a time that was just 
the clouds of the First World War were gathering, and he came, he visited Montreal, and, and really talked in New York and Stanford, in a number of places in, in um, North America. And he was heralded, really, on the, some of the newspapers talked about, you know, the, the peace sage and, and a number of epithets. But when he was leaving North America, he made a little address to those people in New York who were gathered to say goodbye. And these were some of the lines that I thought might be useful to share in terms of his kind of encouragement, because if, if Abdul Baha did anything in the world, it was to encourage, because we are all on the road to hopefully, where encouragement can always enlighten, bring us joy, really, and, okay, so, turn all your thoughts toward bringing joy to hearts. Beware, beware, lest ye offend any heart. Assist the world of humanity as much as possible. Be the source of consolation to every sad one. Assist every weak one. Be helpful to every indigent one. Care for every sick one. Be the cause of glorification to every lowly one. And shelter those who are overshadowed by fear. In brief, let each of you be as a lamp shining forth with the light of the virtues of the world of humanity. Be trustworthy, sincere affectionate and replete with chastity. Be illumined, be spiritual, be divine, be glorious, be quickened of God. Be a Baha'i. <laughs>